one last question for you, uh, Elizabeth. If you agree, the meeting will be put yeah. on YouTube. If you yeah. don't, uh, that's fine. I would recommend, no, that's fine. Uh, as long as you, I would recommend shutting off the comments because I tend to attract a lot of nasty commenters, but uh, uh, so <laughs> that would be uh, no probably problem. a wise thing to do. And I have a lot of <laughs> trolls following me. <laughs> I see, I see. Okay, so uh, let me give you a brief introduction about Dr. Bick. So uh, she was born in the Netherlands. She's, uh, she defines herself as a Dutch American because she's been in, uh, in San Francisco for quite some time. But she was born in the Netherlands. She studied at Utrecht University. Uh, she got her PhD there. And then she moved to uh, work for the National Institute of Public Health and the Environment and San Antonio's Hospital in New England. You, New England, sorry. And then in 2001, she moved to California in the Stanford University, and she's worked there for uh, quite some time, I think 15 years. Uh, and then in 2013, she started um, focusing and getting interested in uh, science integrity uh, when she discovered that one of, uh, of her publications had been plagiarized, uh, at least uh, according to Wikipedia. Yes, she also have a mm -hmm. Wikipedia page. <laughs> <laughs> and um, now, basically, this, this has become a, uh, her full-time job. Uh, she gives talks such as this one. She's a science consultant for uh, both microbiome-related topics and uh, science integrity-related topics. Uh, she has two blogs, one about uh, microbiology and one about science integrity, which are very, very popular. Uh, she has over 125,000 followers on Twitter, which is more than twice the population of L'Aquila, so I think... <laughs> give you some perspective and she also was recently awarded the John Maddox, Maddox, Maddox Prize for outstanding work exposing widespread threats to research integrity in scientific papers. So today she is going to talk about uh, science integrity obviously uh, her talk's title is the dark side of science misconduct in biomedical research. So uh, Elizabeth please the floor is yours. Thank you so much Margot for that nice introduction. And um, you should be seeing my, my slides right now. Yes. So uh, yeah, so um, here are my uh, credentials, my blogs that I founded and my Twitter handle if you are on Twitter. So please follow me. <laughs> I uh, always can use a couple more followers and, and I really need the support because the work that I do obviously makes me uh, some enemies. Um, and before I start off my talk, I do want to make sure that I have all my disclosures in the open because science integrity, um, part of that covers openness and, and you know, don't, uh, don't hide any of your credentials or how you make money or your patents. So here are my disclosures. I make my money by uh, consulting and by getting speakers honoraria. I give this talk for free, so yay. But I uh, work for universities as a consultant and for scientific publishers. And that's usually to give advice about particular cases of suspicions of misconduct. I specialize in images. So that's, that's what I'll do. And that's what I'll be showing lots of examples about. I have worked at a company called Ubiome. I have four patents from that time. But the founders are charged with insurance fraud. So I don't think that's going to make me any money. But here it is, I do have four patents related to microbiome work. I make most of my money by um, a Patreon account. I don't say this to, to ask for money, but this is where people can donate one or one dollar or euro or small amounts of money. And together that gives me a reasonable income. So I can devote most of my time, not as a consultant, but by voluntarily screening the scientific papers for all kinds of problems. And I'm also not the only person doing this. I do want to give credit to this little army of people who are doing very similar work. So we scan the literature for errors and for signs of fraud. And each of us has a slightly different specialty. So I focus on photographic images and plots. Some other people might work on plagiarism or might work on citation rings or might work on statistical problems or might offer the platforms that we use to uh, publicize our work. So I do want to give credit to lots of people who are here, listed here, but also uh, working often under a pseudonym, because you can imagine that this work uh, doesn't is not always appreciated. Basically, 
what we do is criticize other people's papers. So why do we care about publications and why do we care about errors in publication? We care about that because scientists build their research on the work of others. So I see scientific publications as building blocks, as part of a great wall of science onto which every generation layers another layer of bricks. So when we do research, we usually will look at the literature, we will see what other people have published, and we build our work on their work. We also hope, of course, that our work will be cited and inspire others to do new research. So scientists built upon each other's work. But if one of those bricks, one of those publications contains an error or contains even fraud, that might mean that we as scientists could waste a lot of time trying to reproduce that work. So if a paper contains an error or fraud, we should care about that and we should correct the literature because science should be self-correcting. Only then can we make science about finding the truth, which I feel is the heart of doing science. So as scientists, we tend to trust each other's work. We tend to believe if we peer review a paper or if we read a paper, we tend to believe that everything in that paper is true. But that doesn't necessarily need to be the case because there is fraud in science. And uh, like in any other field, there's fraud. So science as a, as a field is not immune to fraud. Uh, let's see. Okay, there we go. So there is science misconduct. Science misconduct basically is science fraud. Now, there are all kinds of questionable research practices that are not necessarily science fraud. It's basically this slippery slope from the perfect paper till the outright fraudulent paper. There's a whole lot in between. And usually we call that questionable research practices. For example, not publishing negative results, not citing relative fund papers, uh, all kinds of statistical errors and flaws and ethical concerns. Well, science misconduct usually is defined as one of three things, and I've listed them here. It depends a little bit. Every country has slightly different definition, but um, I'll, I'll take the US, the USA, where I live as an example. There, science misconduct is defined as one of three things, plagiarism, falsification, or fabrication. Plagiarism is copying texts or ideas without giving credit to the other person. For example, copying a whole stretch of, of uh, text without giving credit or without listing that citation. And that is actually how I started doing this work. I found a science paper and here the red part of that science paper is uh, were two paragraphs I had written, but they had also stolen a lot of other uh, text from other scientists. And so that's plagiarism and I, my paper wasn't even cited. So they had just stolen my sentences. Falsification is where a person measures something, obtains some results, but changes the value, maybe increases a value so it crosses a certain threshold. It becomes from a negative a positive, or maybe leave out the value so uh, because it didn't fit their results. While fabrication is if a person completely makes up results, completely uh, does not do any experiment, but just types in some numbers in Excel spreadsheet or make it, makes a nice graph without actually measuring anything. So that's fabrication. So the PFF or FFP, uh, those are the three flavors of scientific misconduct. Now, um, I can think of different scenarios that drive people to do misconduct. I don't think anybody starts their scientific career thinking, ha ha, let's do some misconduct. Nobody starts their science as a scientist. Nobody starts that way. People do misconduct because we're driven by pressure to publish or by the taste of success or by a power play. And those are three types of things that I think could drive a person to do that. So first of all, we all feel as scientists, the pressure to publish. And it's much easier to, to publish positive results than negative results. So if we are really held accountable by how many papers we publish per year, 
or any other time measure, we are tempted to publish nice, shiny, beautiful results. And we are tempted to change maybe our results or tweak them um, and maybe to even fabricate results because we all feel that pressure to publish. I can also think of a scenario where a person was very successful as a postdoc and maybe has a nature or a science paper, but then when they move uh, on to a new university and they become a professor, they change their research topic a little bit and maybe now the results are not as beautiful as they were, but this person has maybe been on television, has been interviewed, has tasted success and wants to continue that. I feel that's another scenario, another, um, yeah, another reason that could drive a person to become fraudulent in science. And then finally, I think a very common situation is taking into account how much hierarchy there is in science, how much a professor is in a powerful position and can put a lot of pressure on their junior staff to produce positive results. For example, a person in the United States, if they are on a visa, they are very dependent on their professor to get a nice letter of recommendation or to get a publication. And if that professor is not happy with the results that they produce and ask them, I want this experiment to work by Friday, they feel this enormous pressure because if they're fired and they're on a visa, that means they need to leave the US and go back to their home country within five days. And that's an enormous amount of pressure to put on a person. And you can sort of see how in a situation where there's a powerful boss and a person in a, in a yeah, dire circumstances that they might uh, feel the need to cheat, otherwise they would be fired. So these are just some scenarios I think about how people or why people might uh, start to become fraudulent. It's also why I'm respectful for the persons who do it. So I usually, when I talk about science misconduct, and I'll show lots of examples of photos and images that might have been photoshopped or manipulated otherwise, I tend to make it about the figures and maybe the papers, but not about the persons. Because behind every one of these scenarios, behind every case of misconduct, there is a sad story. There's a person who felt the need to do this not because they just thought it was funny to do, but because they feel the pressure and they are fear, fearful of losing their position as a scientist unless they cheat. So I don't wanna make fun of people. I'm not going to name any names. Um, and, and I just want to make it about the, the problems that I'm finding in scientific papers. So my first finding of an image with a potential problem is shown here. It was a set of papers. It actually was a PhD thesis with plagiarism. And I saw in this PhD thesis um, two chapters with images that appear to all look the same. So here are three figures. And you, I've marked in blue a part of an image that look, look the same in each of these three figures, even though these figures represented different uh, experiments or time series or concentration series. So the image had been uh, either like uh, moved a little bit or cropped a little bit differently. And in this case, it was even mirrored, it was flipped. And so that to me suggested that this was not just an accident, that a person deliberately flipped the image and, and made it look like something else. And so I reported these and these papers were re retracted. But I also realized that apparently I have a strange talent for finding these duplications because each of these papers had been peer reviewed and published in a respectable journal. And so maybe people weren't really looking for these things, but I could look for photographic images and maybe detect this. So what I did is I realized that photos in scientific papers, they are part of the data. They're not just illustrations, not to make it look nice. Photos in scientific papers are showing us data. They're, they're, uh, and, and they're also unique. So if you look at some photos that you might find in scientific papers, like here, these are all fine photos. There's nothing wrong with them. There's no duplications. 
but we can see that our eyes are very good in finding patterns and, and comparing these images and showing that each of these photos are unique. Even photos of DNA gels or proteins, uh, so like this uh, Western blot, we can see that all these bands have slightly different backgrounds and shapes and sizes and dots and spots. We can tell them apart. And we can also tell because our brains are so, and we're so visual, we're so good in detecting, you know, faces and leaves and rocks and realizing that all these things in nature are unique. We can also see that there might be duplications in images. So after scanning lots of papers, I realized that there are sort of roughly three types of duplications that one can find. First, there's the simple duplication. This is a, a, pan, a bunch of panels, and you can see each of these panels is unique, except for these two pairs marked by me with red boxes. So I usually draw boxes of the same color around things that look identical to me. And, and these two also look uh, very similar. Usually I use the word very, very similar to keep me out of legal trouble. Um, to, uh, so two panels that are identical, but in both cases, these are exactly the same photos being used twice. Now, this is often just a genuine error, just an honest error. Somebody didn't label their photos very well. That's not good, but it's not really done with the intention to mislead the reader. But that might be different with these types of duplications here on the right, which are repositioned duplication. So they could be uh, photos that are a little bit shifted or mirrored or stretched or, or rotated, things like that. So here you see four photos representing cells being treated with four different types of radiation, but two photos overlap with each other and two other photos also overlap. Basically these three photos all came from the same specimen that was moved under the microscope a little bit. And yeah, I don't know, that to me is, is very sloppy or even maybe done intentionally. And, and here you see the same, these are two Western blots representing uh, different proteins and different cellular locations and yet they overlap with each other. So these are repositioned photos. And then here on the bottom left, we see what I call a duplication with an alteration. Basically, we're looking at photos with duplicated elements. So gel bands or uh, protein bands or uh, parts of a photo, maybe a cell or, or parts of a tissue are duplicated within the same photo. So it's like Photoshopping. It would be like looking at a photo of a dinner table and seeing Uncle John twice in the same photo. Uh, maybe Uncle John has a twin brother, but um, usually you would not expect to see the same person in a photo twice. So that is sort of the, the same situation as I see here. I see the same band three times in this photo and two times in this photo marked in, in blue or red boxes. And so that is very unexpected and almost always done with an intention to mislead. So uh, summary, um, type one duplication is very likely to be an honest error. Type three duplication is very likely to have been done intentionally. So, do, uh, so basically science misconduct. Well, the type two duplications could be either one, honest error or intentional, do, intentionally done. But especially if a photo is rotated or stretched, there seems to be an intention to mislead the reader. So some examples of these photos. So here's a, a type one duplication. You see a bunch of panels here, all the photos are different, but there's two photos that are identical. And uh, again, I wanna stress that this is not science misconduct. In my opinion, this is an honest error. And it was quickly corrected. Well, quickly in scientific, Publication terms means a couple of months, but that's relatively quickly, as you will see later on. Uh, so I reported this to the journal, to the editor in chief of uh, PLOS ONE, and it got corrected. And the authors apologized. They, they actually said, yeah, sorry, we, we used the wrong photo. And here is the, the correct photo. So that's all good. But here's a type two duplication, and I'll show you the photo without my markings first. So you might spot, if you're good at this, you uh, 
and you, you will be hopefully a little bit better after uh, hearing my talk, you might spot there's lots of duplicated elements here. Lots of these photos overlap, even though they represent different cell lines and different uh, treatments. There's lots of overlaps here. And this paper got retracted. And I think, again, this is a good outcome. It did take a couple of years after I reported it and banging on the door of plus one every time, like, don't forget about me. And finally, they retracted the paper. But 27 papers cited this paper. So 27 other research group might have built their research on this particular figure. And I think that's really bad because I would not trust anything that came out of this lab if they have so many overlaps. It's either extremely sloppy or done intentionally. There's another example. This is a Western blot. And here two panels overlap with each other with a rotation over the horizontal axis, while the two gap DH panels are uh, also, they, they appear to look the same to me with a vertical stretch. And so both would hint at an intention to mislead. I reported this to the journal and the institution in October, 2019. But here we are in 2022 and it has not been addressed. This paper is still out there with its big error. And how do we warn other people? Because apparently the journal did not really want to address this for whatever reasons. Here's a photo of fungal spores uh, with some duplications in it. And you might have spotted it. The duplications are here. There's two cells that, two spores that look the same. And here's a bunch of spores that also look the same. In my book, this looks like Photoshopping, but, and it should be retracted because why would I Photoshop, uh, you know, the same spore twice. It, it seems very obvious to me, but the, uh, the peer reviewers did not catch this. Uh, so I reported this online and it got corrected. I think that's not a good outcome because I don't know, I would not trust these results very much, but that's what happened. So here's one from a institution in Marseille that uh, has also published some uh, papers about hydroxychloroquine and claimed that it could uh, prevent or treat be used to treat COVID-19 patients, uh, their papers seem to have a, a lot of problems. And I found this particular paper unrelated to COVID-19, was published in 2003. And uh, this is a southern blot in this figure. And the longer you look at this photo, you might have spotted that there are several duplications here. And I've marked them here with colored boxes. So some bands and some of the DNA smears appear to have been duplicated. I reported this online, but it has not been addressed yet. This paper is still out there on, uh, without any markings that there might be a big problem with it. Here's another example of a, uh, a type three duplication, a uh, duplication with uh, re repetitive elements within the same photo. In this case, the bottom blot, HSP70 blot, appear to all contain the same band based here in the top lot, this particular band appears to be, have been uh, stretched and duplicated and rotated and used in all kinds of or orientations and uh, try to sort of show that with these colored arrows and, and colored uh, circles. And this paper is retracted, luckily. I feel that's a good outcome because nothing in this photo is true. It's all based on a very different blot, uh, uh, band over here in a different lot. And so this paper got retracted. There's many other uh, really, really bad examples. So this is a very colorful example where all, you know, all parts of these photos are duplicated. And the longer you look, the more you see this paper got retracted. That's a good outcome. Uh, here's one with nanoparticles. This is a transmission electron, uh, sorry, scanning electron microscopy photo of nanoparticles. Everything seems to be duplicated here, but it's not been retracted. Still waiting for that. Uh, here's another example of a uh, laser treatment. Uh, on the left, you see the patient before the laser treatment and on the right, six months after the laser treatment. But the guy is wearing the same shirt and all the hairs and other spots other than the, the disappeared uh, brown spots in his face, uh, all the other elements of the photo look the same. So it appears that either the brown spots were photoshopped in or photoshopped out. Um, 
but either way, there seems to be some photo manipulation. And this paper got retracted. The authors kept on uh, saying that they that the guy just happened to wear the same shirt six months later, but uh, luckily the editor uh, did not buy that. There's photoshopping in uh, flow cytometry, which now is sort of flaw cytometry. Lots of uh, duplicated elements in these photos um, shown here with colored boxes. There can be duplications in spectrum, so type three duplication where the background, the noise, appears to contain repetitive elements also got retracted and all kinds of other things. So I did a sort of selective screen for these types of problems by scanning these papers by eye. I scanned 20,000 papers and I found 4% of those papers, 800 papers to contain duplicated elements. And we estimated that about half of these, so 2% of these papers contain duplicated photos with an intention to mislead. Now, does that mean that 2% of all papers contain uh, scientific misconduct? We actually think it's much more because it's much harder to detect duplications or, or manipulations of data if the data is not a photo. We can recognize these duplications, but if a person is a very good Photoshopper or if a person just makes up a line graph and draws something nice uh, without actually doing an experiment, I would never know that by just looking at the figures. So we believe the real percentage of misconduct might be between five and 10%. And that's a very scary number. It might mean that it's very likely you've come across a paper that contains manipulated data and you might not have realized that. Now, what happens if you report these papers? Unfortunately, not much happens. Journals are very slow to respond. So this initial set of papers that I found, almost 800 papers, waiting five years after reporting these to the, to the journal editors, 65%, two thirds of the papers, nothing has happened after I waited five years after I reported it. 27% got corrected, 7% got retracted, and a tiny sliver here is an expression of concern. But it's, it's really bad that scientific journals are not doing anything of quality control. If you come back to them and saying, hey, there's a problem with the paper, most of them do not respond to that. Or they'll respond, but at least they don't take action. And I have now, by now, found many more papers. So I've now almost 6,000 papers, not just the 800 I had five years ago, six years ago. And again, these numbers sort of uphold. Two thirds are not addressed after waiting several years. So that's a very bad outcome. And unfortunately, institutions are also not very good in responding. They actually seem to really not want to discuss this at all. In many cases with, for example, very obvious fraud where like parts of these figures have been duplicated. The, the, in this case, uh, the, the researcher was found to be not guilty of fraud. I'm like, well, this is not an accident. This, this cannot happen by accident. And, and so, yeah, it's, it's so bad for science that institutions just do not want to address these problems. They keep on giving grants and awards and, and uh, lovely words to researchers, even if they do fraud, nothing seems to happen. So knowing that not much happens, like how can we best warn other researchers that there might be a big problem with a paper? So I use pubpeer.com, which is a website where you can comment on papers. And for example, if you do a journal club on a paper, it would be a nice place to post your comments there. So uh, there's also a plugin that you can install. And, and so if you do a literature search and you have a plugin installed, you can see that these green banners appear on papers that have a comment. And you can click on the green banner and you'll see the comment on pubpeer.com. So I've now posted of the 6,000 papers that I've found with problems, I've posted uh, almost all of them on Papier, but I'm still in the process of finishing that up. That's the best way, I believe, to warn researchers that there might be a problem with the paper. But you have to install the plugin. It's a tiny little thing that runs in your browser. It works with Zotero if you use that as a reference manager as well. And that's the best we can do. Now, 
you might ask a question if we can use artificial intelligence to detect these problems. Can we use software to find these duplicated images? Because I've found most of the, the examples that I've shown you by eye. Now, of course, software in theory could be much better to detect these things. Not only can it compare images within the same paper, it can compare any image against all images that have ever been published similar to a Google search. Um, so people are working on these types of software uh, tools, but it's much harder than you might think. So I've worked in a, in a DARPA, uh, uh, the Metaphor uh, challenge, and many groups started to, to find these duplications by writing software, but it's only several years later now that, that these software are trying, are, are getting a little bit better. You can still not completely rely on them but I'm using uh, uh, image twin is sort of my main go-to tool that I'm using. Most of the other tools I don't have access to. Now, so AI can be used to, artificial intelligence can be used to spot these duplications, but unfortunately it can also be used to generate fake images. So this is sort of a, a two-edged sword. AI can be used for good things, but also for bad things. So you might be familiar with the website thispersondoesn'texist.com, which uh, uses AI or machine learning technology to generate faces, photos of images, photos of faces that look very realistic. But these people do not exist. These are uh, based using GAN technology, Generative Adversarial Network. So it's, it's basically a library of noses and mouths and hairs and eyes and it generates a new photo based on on this and i of course simplify this a lot but you just click on the website and it generates a new face every time this can be used for bad purposes obviously so these people do not exist they're fake photos completely uh made out of parts of faces and uh if we can use faces uh, if we can make faces that look believable, because you tend to believe that these photos are real, they look pretty realistic. Um, yeah, how, how easy would it be to generate something else? Well, it might not be as easy as you think. So it's GIN technology is not very good with cats, I've noticed. So these photos of cats are uh, made using GIN technology. And we can recognize, obviously, that these are not real cats. They have too many legs or the heads are not at the right position, but I think it can probably do much better a couple of years from now on. But these photos uh, or these technology can also be used to generate images of Western blots, of protein blots, like you can see here. And together with a bunch of other people, we have found uh, hundreds of papers that I believe have been uh, these photos in these papers have been created using GIN technology based on a library of, of Western blot bands, and they look pretty realistic. These are two different papers, two different groups of authors, two different publishers and journals. But if you zoom in on these photos, there are elements that are repetitive. So um, this project was, was uh, worked on by many people, uh, so I'm listing all their names here. And these photos all had the same background, which is how we recognized it. So they made an error. They didn't generate any random background, uh, but they used these artificially generated bands to put on a background that was all the same. So we could recognize, for example, this vertical stripe here. There's some, some other elements of these photos that are all the same across a set of 600 papers from many different uh, re research institutions and hospitals in China. And so this is what we believe generated by a company which we call paper mills, scientific paper mills that generate fake papers with fake data uh, and fake authors. Well, the names are real, but they're, they sell these papers to authors who need papers. And so the, this is a problem in countries that offer very strong financial rewards if you publish a paper like China and Russia. And uh, yeah, these are being sold to authors. And so they, these paper mills generate hundreds and hundreds of papers that are completely fake. Uh, and I've 
not only worked on paper mills, there's also people who create fake institutions. And I have two more or less funny examples because these are, are sort of funny. Uh, I don't want to make fun of the, the persons, but these people, there's, these are two examples of people who have made up a fake institution and sort of uh, published papers with their fake institution and uh, don't have too much time, but I want to point out the California South University, which is a completely fake university. It doesn't exist, but it has a website. And this person just publishes paper after paper after paper, claiming they work at, at this university. The address actually is a, just a general home address in California. Um, and, and same here, this person claims to work at a research institution in New York, but the address leads to a simple apartment in Staten Island. And so it's unlikely that these are real institutions, but they sort of create this whole fake identity and publish. And it, it's, it's fantastic and it's funny. And you can, you can uh, look up these examples online. There's many websites written about them and uh, there, are, there are rabbit holes to go into and you'll find more and more of these funny examples and not quite sure why people do this but um, probably their claim to fame by making up fake institutions. And then finally, the work that we whistleblowers do to find these images and these uh, other fake papers is not without risk because of course I make some enemies. I have, uh, I try not to accuse people of fraud, but of course I, talk about these images on on Twitter or on Papier and researchers whose work I criticize are not always happy with that. So I'm currently facing two legal challenges. One I think is well, not as uh, serious as the other one. So the French institution where I found lots of problems with, they are uh, claiming that they're going to sue me because I am, yeah, uh, I, I bring down their reputation, I'm harassing them, they, that's how they call it. Luckily, I've received a lot of support from the scientific community, but I do realize that the work that I'm doing could financially ruin me because I do not work for a university. I don't have any help, uh, I work by myself. So I could, in theory, lose all my money and lose my house and lose everything I have, my pension, trying to defend myself. So I hope there's going to be some legal protection and at least some support by the scientific community for the work that I'm doing. And I try to really not uh, make any false accusations. I really try to, uh, to only raise concerns that other people can see as well. So this is my last slide. I have talked about a bunch of problems in scientific papers. I've talked about what I think the percentage of science misconduct is. And again, I think it is between five to 10%. I've talked a little bit about reasons why people will commit science misconduct. And about maybe the fact that we focus too much on publications as a measure of productivity for us scientists. If we only accept positive and nice and shiny results um, to be published, we put too much pressure on people. They will then falsify results. So it's important to also allow journals to accept negative results because those are results as well. And we should get credit for it. I've talked a little bit about the conflicts of interest. Publishers do not seem to really want to address these problems. And the same with institutions for all kinds of reasons. We can discuss that in the discussion. Whose role is it to detect science misconduct? I believe it should not be unpaid volunteers like me. Well, I get paid through Patreon, but in basically I don't get a salary for it. I only get uh, legal threats for it, basically. Um, so it should be up to the publishers who we pay a lot of money to get our papers published or to download those papers, depending on which model they, they use to publish the papers. It should be up to the publishers to do a better quality control. It's very important to catch these things before they get published because after they're published, they're out there and it's very hard to retract them. Publishers need to do a much better 
role in, in uh, screening these papers for these type of problems and be much faster in retracting them or just correcting them after problems have been found by others. So I talked about legal protection for whistleblowers, but finally, there's also a tremendous cost for science in general, not just for the scientists who are trying to reproduce papers that are uh, maybe contain errors or fraud, but for science as a whole, because any of you could walk away from my talk claiming that all science is fraudulent. And I do not want that to be my message. I want my message to be, yes, science has flaws, but we should do better in correcting the literature and screening for these things. So don't think that science is all flawed. Uh, it would be too much of an easy conclusion because we have seen in the past two years with the pandemic, how much distrust there is in science. A lot of people have lost their trust in science. There's lots of misinformation out there. And that is the real damage of science misconduct because all these retracted papers could lead people to say, oh, well, we cannot trust science at all. But I want you to trust science because science is going to be the only way we can get out of pandemics, can solve climate change, all the big problems we are facing in the world. We can only solve those if we trust and believe and do good science. So I hope that's the, the message of, uh, of my talk. And with that, if you are on Twitter, I'm Microbiome Digest without E. Uh, you can play the game Image Forensics. And uh, the first person who solves the duplication in the image will get an emoji award. So with that, uh, thank you. And I'll be happy to take any questions. OK, thank you very much. Um was a really, really interesting talk. Really, congratulations. And I'm happy to say I won. I was one of the awardees of, <laughs> of your Twitter <laughs> emoji prizes once. Yes. So very happy about that. So um, we can start the discussion um, if anyone wants to start. Uh, otherwise, I'll just say that uh, you're right in, in saying that not all signs should be just dismissed as false, but it's still quite worrisome that I don't know, I would write a review and quote 150 papers and 15 of them could be <laughs> wrong, you know? It's... It could be. I mean, it's. Uh, I do think it's more prevalent in certain areas than in others. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, the paper mills have specifically targeted non-coding RNA and oncology. So there's specific fields penetrated by these paper mills. But yeah, it could be in any field. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think uh, Oriana raised the hand and Professor Teddy. So Oriana, uh, I think raised first. Hello. Hello. Um, thank you for your talk. I have so many questions. It was really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I wanted to start maybe with something quite broad. Um, you talked a bit about how as like students and scientists, we can um, check the papers we're reading. But I was wondering, have you thought maybe about as a citizen, how we can think about how we trust science. And I think that's been highlighted maybe by the COVID pandemic, you know, there was a lot of information and lots of conspiracies. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I was wondering your thoughts on that. Oh, it's, that's a, a very broad and tough to answer question because there are many papers that turn out to be fraudulent that you would not be able to have spotted just by looking at it, even if you're a well-trained scientist. So for example, the Sergi Sphere paper that claimed that hydroxychloroquine uh, was not effective. I mean, the, the final conclusions were backed up by other studies, but the data itself in that study was uh, at least partially fabricated, so made up. And I even tweeted that paper. I had not spotted that. And so it's, it's like almost impossible to know which papers are fraudulent or not. So in some cases, you really have to know the data really well and compare it to the published data to, to have spotted this or you have to have access to raw data. So there's many cases where nobody, not even a well-trained scientist could have spotted it. But there's also many cases where it is a little bit obvious if, you, if a good re peer reviewer could have spotted it, but this is why it's so important to screen, to have quality control before it gets published. Because once it's published, it's hard to know the real data. It's easy for people to use that data to 
walk away with and 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 spread misinformation so once it's published it's it's out there we need to find these things uh during peer review and during editorial review before they get published thank you great so uh professor teddy Oh, yes, I could ask 25 questions, and, uh, yeah. but uh, there are a few points that I would like to, to stress a little bit. Uh, one is that uh, for reviewers and also for the editors, it's really very difficult to spot um, mistakes or uh, uh, fraudulent uh, be uh, mm -hmm. uh, behavior, uh, because you need to go through the paper word by word and uh, figure by figure, which takes a lot. And the reviewers are not paid, uh, they are not professional, so this is a, a big problem. Another problem that I see is that there is a, a lot of pressure from the journals, uh, because uh, uh, I mean, I, I, when I read these big papers with the 25 figures, uh, each with the 30 panels at the end, I, I cannot recall uh, either 1% of uh, the details. And this is a big problem, I think. So there is also pressure from the, the, the journals, and this is a problem. In fact, I really trust the historical journals, the journals that are there since uh, the, the first decades of the last centuries because they uh, uh, can be tr really trusted. But these new journals <sighs> have some problems mm -hmm. uh, for that. And uh, I mean, the, the manipulation of data has been always a problem. In fact, uh, maybe you can re remember uh, our generation used to, to say that there was some uh, data massage just to improve this and that. So people did this, but it was easier in early times to identify these mistakes because the papers were simpler, the figures were big and not the small uh, stamps that uh, you cannot check in detail. And this is something that, uh, uh, this, this is a change that went for worse instead of better. So we have to convince the young people that this is not the, the, the best way to uh, make their data public. And I think that you did a really great job in this. Uh, so, so just comments. I don't know if you want to add something, I would be absolutely happy. Yeah, I, I completely agree with your points. Data, like scientific papers have grown enormously compa complex and they're really hard to peer review also because they're more and more multidisciplinary so i'm as a peer reviewer i might know i might understand part of the paper but completely have no idea about other parts of the papers and you're right like some some of them have like i don't know 59 supplemental figures who is going to check all of that um, and i have some software where that i can use to to dump the figures in and hope that it will find some duplications but it's it's still not completely trustworthy and has lots of false positives as well. So I, I would be a big uh, supporter of publishing smaller amounts of data and not having these complete stories, but publishing just one figure and one little uh, experiment and having that peer reviewed in some way and, and becoming maybe less dependent on, on uh, big publishing houses. Um, and I have found these duplications even in uh, maybe trustworthy journals like Science and Nature. So they're, they're everywhere. And uh, sometimes actually society journals do really well. Uh, that's, that's another point I would want to add. But I agree that papers are uh, very complex, hard to peer review. And so we need paid people to look at it from a misconduct and error catching type of uh, uh, point of view. So I would be in favor of uh, publishers hire, hiring editors or like peer reviewers, basically paid peer reviewers who are paid to screen papers with a particular mindset, like could this be fraud or could this be, could this contain a statistical error? Uh, let me add that for these big journals, uh, doesn't matter if it, uh, the, the results are fraudulent or not, because uh, they are quoted. Yes, and so the impact factor goes uh, high. Yeah, that's so even yeah. if the, the the papers are quoted for negative uh, issues. So, 
sorry, <laughs> I stopped here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, oh, uh, Professor Civitelli, please. He knows a thing or two about uh, society papers. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, yeah. Well, uh, thank you, Elizabeth, for uh, your presentation. It was really a treat. Um, uh, you know, I've been following your work as well as uh, uh, Retraction Watch and all the other, you know, uh, we, uh, uh, data sleuths, and they help us a lot. And, and my experience here as uh, editor in chief of a uh, Society Journal, and I'm glad about, I, I appreciate your comments about the Society Journal being perhaps, uh, uh, you know, the bastion of, uh, 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 let's say, not necessarily as the, uh, um, uh, the, the, the most highly uh, reputed, but certainly as a, uh, as a, as, as a model to be followed uh, for ensuring at least participation of uh, uh, the researchers directly in the, uh, 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 the scientific publishing as compared to a big um, uh, you know, the profit driven um, uh, publishers. Um, the comment I was gonna make is about, you, know, the, you, you raised a lot of questions. Uh, and uh, my personal experience is that as I uh, uh, took the helm of the journal back in 2018, uh, this problem really exploded in my face. Uh, the, the, the journal had no mechanism and no idea of how to deal with this because there really was no need uh, for any structure since uh, the uh, problems were just very few. Uh, but then between 2018 and 2020, we received uh, um, more than 50, maybe 60 um, uh, complaints from uh, uh, whistleblowers. And also to thank uh, your colleague, Claire Francis, to, <laughs> for that. Uh, <laughs> I um, am not Claire Francis, by the way, but yeah. <laughs> OK. Uh, and uh, 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 so we, we had to really to react in a different way. And you know, it took a while. Uh, but finally, the society recognized that this was a big problem, and uh, uh, we created a, a panel of volunteer members who would look into these problems in a systematic way. We call it the Research Integrity Panel, and serves not only uh, JVMR, but also JVMR Plus. By the way, uh, the advice is here also among the, uh, 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 the, the attendants, and she's the editor in chief of JVMR Plus um, as well. So. Uh, she can uh, probably uh, uh, give her uh, give us uh, her uh, take as well. Uh, so I mean that that has helped us quite a bit in uh, addressing uh, pending issues. The problem uh, that uh, you just were discussing before is how to deal with uh, 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 you know incoming papers. Um, how to how you know the readers can realize or. Uh, start you know, uh, raising doubts about uh, the integrity of uh, what they read. Uh, there is really no solution. Uh, it, it's just, uh, it's gonna take a while really to change the culture um, and to, for people to understand uh, how the, what the problem is and start uh, recognizing uh, the quality of the data rather than taking everything at face value. Uh, so, uh, that, that's, that's really uh, what I want to say. I, I could go on forever, uh, uh, but uh, I think you opened up uh, several very important points. Some of them we still don't have the uh, full solution for. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I'll just let uh, Deborah jump in, uh, just because she is, the, her comment will be connected to this. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, um, I just took over uh, late last year at JBMR Plus, and um, one of the things that um, we've been working towards doing is inviting people to submit papers with um, more incremental or negative results. Um, I can't say we've gotten a ton of those papers yet, but um, I did see that as a as a need. Um, you know, my lab has been one that. You know, has also sometimes, you know, done a lot of work that we thought was going to lead us somewhere and it, uh, mm -hmm. you know, did not uh, give us the results we expected. And um, 
I do hope that uh, we won't be alone in um, convincing authors. And I think that's one problem of convincing authors to actually write up their negative results and send them in um, and you know perform the work in as rigorous a manner as um, they do when they get positive results. Because I think sometimes people get negative results and just walk away. And then we never know that the results were negative. So um, I think, you know, there's um, a culture shift that is going to be needed to, uh, you know, really help uh, keep that wall strong. Yeah, no, that's that's uh, that's a great initiative. And I, I do believe that um, pre-registration of clinical trials, as we you know, that's not applicable to all research. But if it's clinical trials, there's more and more demand to pre-register your plans and to pre-register that you'll publish the results, even if they're negative. So this is sort of part of open science and, um, and open data and, and all those good developments where like you, you tell upfront what your plans will be and, and that you'll publish it no matter what the outcome will be. So I believe this, is a, this will lead to more negative results being published. And we just need that in order to avoid other people pursuing the same ideas and running against the same outcome, uh, we need to have that published as well. Yeah, but it's also a problem in more basic research, basic and translational research, where it's, it's easier to maybe, um, you know, clinical studies often keep their data blinded until it's all collected, but right. that's not the way it works in the lab. No. So I think that's going to be an even bigger um, problem to, to address. Yeah, and, and uh, there's just more and more results. And like we discussed before, results are more and more complex. So um, it's, it's just, we just need different models of publishing results, not just having, uh, not just maybe relying on traditional publishing outlets, but um, yeah, more open science, more preprints, more repositories, more, uh, I, I'm just thinking of a website where you can just publish one experiment and. Mm -hmm. Uh, that and then other people can peer review it. Other people can, you know, publicly comment on it. Other people can reproduce it and then get also points for that. Some some way of crediting not only people publishing results but other people reproducing it. I think that would be a, a good development and something we've been missing because we just need more reproducibility and and credit for doing those experiments as well. Absolutely. It's great. Sorry, uh, we have a lot of raised hands, so I'm going to have to ask you to keep the questions and answers short, please. So <laughs> I know it's a really interesting right. <laughs> question, but uh, Annabelle. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. It was really, really interesting. Um, so something you've actually just touched on that I was going to ask about is the reproducibility crisis. So mm -hmm. this is something that obviously I think many labs are facing. I myself have spent months trying to reproduce data that I've found in papers with zero success. Mm -hmm. And I suppose my question is what your advice would be to junior scientists like myself, where we're spending a lot of time doing this work and whether we have a responsibility also to report this to journals in the same way that you do, if we're finding that data simply isn't reproducible and the, the authors aren't sort of happy to share differences in the protocols. Right. Um... I mean, that's, I cannot give an easy answer, obviously. I, again, with science becoming more and more complex and limited space in papers, often there's limits for the amount of, uh, you know, words in the methods, which is, you know, has its own problems. Uh, many researchers are not able to share all the details or are not willing to share details. And that's an that's a important difference. And a paper not being reproducible is not necessarily a sign of misconduct, but often the other way around, misconduct leads to non-reproducibilities. And I've, I've dealt with some cases where people have written me like this, I have never been able to re reproduce any of this author's work, and they have published several papers about it, nobody else can reproduce this, and then I'm finding all kinds of photo uh, problems in it or, or image manipulation. But I think it's often more unwillingness of an author to share their secret sauce or their secret, you know, little flick they give to the tube that makes it work. And, and they just know how to get it to work, but they don't publish all the details on purpose. I'm not sure how to, how to 
solve that other than asking people to be more descriptive or have, have a larger supplemental dealt with the, the details. But we often know that the details reported in papers are by far not enough to really know how to perform the experiment. That's great, thank you. Sorry, no good answers for you, but <laughs> it's just a general problem, yeah. So we're running out of time. We only have time for one quick question from Giovanni Bahar. Please uh, write the question in the chat so maybe Elizabeth can write you up oh, later. Yes, sure. Oh, thank you very much, Marco. And very interesting talk, Elizabeth. Very thank you. Uh, I'm a technologist, so uh, I would like to defend technology a little bit, saying that uh, actually technology can be used also to detect fakes. Uh, as well as uh, fa face detector, um, fake detectors for faces uh, and for images. But uh, I'm not, that's not my point. I would like to say that uh, maybe we should rethink the review process and uh, we should uh, ask to authors to certify data. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, research integrity is uh, based on data integrity and data is given by numbers and images and everything. Nowadays, there are many, many technologies that can help to certify data. I'm talking about blockchain, I'm talking about cryptography, uh, uh, digital signatures. So maybe your next uh, uh, electrophoresis uh, uh, apparatus can actually uh, sign electronically what is producing and you will, produce, you will publish not just the image, but also the uh, digital signature of that image. Okay, that's just the point. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so uh, I don't know if you wanna comment on that, uh, Elizabeth? Yeah, no, I, I think it's a valid point. I, I do think that frauds are, are going to fraud, so I'm sure they, they find ways to create data that looks convincing, but uh, it, it's a little bit too technical for me to be able to answer. It's, it's outside of my knowledge scope, but uh, we need better ways of ensuring what the actual raw data was and how it was manipulated to, because some manipulation is okay, like we crop, right, and we enhance the contrast, that's all okay. Um, but how far is the published image, uh, the, the, how far away is it from the, the raw data? So uh, I think that's, that will be a good suggestion but it's outside of my knowledge scope. And I can hang around a little bit longer. I have no deadline, but I know some of you need to go to other mm. assignments. Yes, uh, we're quite strict on time because we have classes and professor being very um, busy, sure. but uh, Elizabeth left her email in the chat. So uh, she's happy to answer your questions, uh, Claudia and Bahar. So thank you very much. This was a fantastic discussion. Thanks again for uh, being here today with us uh, in such a small context compared to what you're used to, but I'm sure you had fun <laughs> as well because we're very active as you can see. So um, yeah, thanks again and uh, I'll see you soon. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for inviting me. Bye. Bye-bye.